starting from the from from your left, uh, Lacey Golanka, Keeney Martin, and Jennifer Hill, and thank them very much for coming today uh, to talk about their experiences as women in the military. So what I'm going to do, uh, and I'm going to ask you for your patience uh, today because we have three speakers instead of just one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a multi-part question to, to, to the three of them and ask them individually to respond to that question. And that is, what was it in their early life that, that caused them or compelled them to go into the military in the first place? Then, how was their experience in the military? And then after leaving the military, their, what, what did that experience bring to their either corporate career or their their later life as their as it is today. So so those three parts, uh, you know, answer that to the best of their ability. What we're going to do is take maybe 15 to 20 minutes each uh, for them to talk through that, and then I would ask you to hold your questions until all three of them are finished, and then you can ask a sort of a general question to all three of them or to each of them individually. And, and that's kind of the way we'll do that today, if, if that's okay. So we'll just start <clears throat> now with, with Lacey, okay? And then, and then again, what was it that, you know, in your early life that compelled you to go into the military as a female? Uh, and, then, and then how was your experience in general? And then, and then what did you take to your, your corporate career or your, your later life as, as it was from the military? Okay, and okay. thank you guys again very much for being part of, of today's uh, conversation. Thank you. So I was just leaning over and telling Keeney it's only going to take me about five, ten minutes because my favorite part's really the questions at the end. <laughs> um, but I don't have the history of anybody in my family being in the military at all whatsoever. I'm the first, and I'm actually the youngest daughter and kind of a daddy's girl, so mm -hmm. I somewhat lied I would say to get my dad to let me enlist because I was 17 but I was a Girl Scout I was a junior police officer and then my senior year of high school I had an extra class I needed to take and they said you can go back to PE or you can do you know JROTC in high school and I said you know whatever let's try this JROTC I'm a senior it's not like it's gonna be anything that's gonna take forever I did that they had a Ranger team where you can build Swiss seats do some sort of repelling and put on BDUs. And once I put on BDUs, I don't know what it was. I loved being in uniform. I love kind of regimented lifestyles. And I knew I wanted to join the military at that point. Um, from Hawaii, born and raised. And I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated high school. I just knew I wanted to do something. So I was 17 when I graduated. I We have family dinners. I went home and I told my parents, hey, can you sign this? It's to take an ASVAB. It's like SAT, ACT. This is testing stuff so I could go to college and whatever. I'll be the first to go to college. Don't worry. Just go ahead and sign this. And of course, you know, my parents trusted me. I was a, a decent child. And so my dad signed it. And then I came home and I took my ASVAB and ended up enlisting that day. And we have family dinners, no TV, no phones. And you sit down and everybody's saying, well, what'd you do today? How was your day? And I said, oh, I joined the army today. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty sure my dad dropped his fork and he looked at me and he said, yeah, that's not possible. You're 17. I said, well, you signed the paper. <laughs> and uh, my mom was extremely mad. I think she gave him the death look. And I was like, don't worry, don't worry. I'm in the guard. One week in a month, two weeks in the summer, coming back home to Hawaii, not a big deal. This was in 2004, so we were, you know, in operations in Iraq at that time. So I went to boot camp, went to IT, came home, went straight to Iraq three weeks later. And so my dad was extremely upset, but very supportive now. So I kind of just jumped into it. I, I don't think that there was any real big, you know, I'm going to join the Army. I actually, so I'm in the Army. I, I walked into the Army. They weren't going to give me my job. I walked over to the Marine Corps and I was like, oh, hell no, this is way too hard. So I go, <laughs> these people, these recruiters, they're real tough. So I walked out and I walked in the Air Force and I was like, this is too easy. And I was like, I'm not even going to try the Navy because I'm not going to go sit on a ship because I was a female. And I was like, well, I'm going to go join the Army again, whatever. I just want to join the service. So that's how I ended up in the Army. Um, I'm still in the Guard. So I'm still in the Army National Guard. And I've been in for 13 years now, and my time in the military has been kind of different. My first deployment to Iraq was uh, very interesting. I was a private, and I was 
18, I turned 18 in boot camp, I turned 19 in Iraq. So I was very young and kind of inexperienced and I think it was my hardest, toughest deployment. Uh, my second deployment to Kuwait was easy, it was a cakewalk, I was almost bored. Um, but it was, again, a good learning experience, a little, I was in E6 at the time, so it's kind of moving up in rank and, and getting actual responsibilities. And my last tour was in 2014, I went over to Afghanistan, probably my hardest, best deployment I've ever had, learned the most, grew the most. Um, so it's kind of what I've had while I was in, I've seen the military change a lot uh, since I've been in in the last 13 years, and I have enjoyed every minute of it. So, um, what's the last question? I, corporate life. Keeney actually recruited me out of the, the senator's office to come work for Excel. So uh, I think what the military prepared me to do, honestly, is networking. Um, you get a great veterans community. You get to talk to people. You can give back in that aspect, which I love volunteerism, so I kind of love being in that veteran space. And it really made me grow up quick. I think that the military kind of sets you on a path for success. It's hard not to be kind of driven when you, I, w I wouldn't say get out since I'm still in the guard, but when you kind of transition from active duty deployment style to coming back and having to work life balance, um, I think it's really given me that flexibility, that drive, that networking experience and really growing. I think the biggest thing I learned coming back is when I was 18 and I turned 19 in Iraq, I came back and I saw my high school friends at 19 and I was like, I just can't connect with you anymore. You don't have that same level of experience. You don't even realize there's a war going on. I, d I don't know how to have a conversation with you. You're still worried about what somebody's wearing and who's dating who. And I think I just, it kind of drove me apart from that. But it, I think that it's given me the life skills and the maturity I needed to kind of step off on the right foot going forward. So. Thanks, Lacey. So my name is Keeney Martin, and I currently work for XL Energy. Uh, what made me want to get into the Army? Uh, my grandfather helped to raise myself and my two younger brothers growing up. I am a native of Colorado, from Colorado Springs originally. Uh, my mom is from Taiwan, and is my grandma. And in Taiwan, they have a required military service. So every kid has to do two years of military service upon graduation from high school. And my mom did that two years in the military. She herself never went in. Uh, but having kids of her own, she had always instilled in my brothers and myself the need to give back to your community, to participate in your civic duty, um, and to just really be active in giving back. So being raised by my grandfather, my grandmother, and a single mom, my grandfather is actually a West Point graduate, class of 1939, who served 32 years in the Army. And uh, he really was my male role model growing up and had always encouraged me to marry a West Pointer, uh, which I eventually did. Um, but up until that point, there was never any pressure to join the military. And honestly, it was a spur of the moment impulse move. Uh, similar to Lacey, in many ways, I was actually going to college at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. I was in my sophomore year of college when I got a letter in the mail. Do you remember that cadence, got a letter in the mail? I, that literally happened to me. And so I got a letter in the mail saying, you can go to camp at Fort Knox, Kentucky, experience the Army for four weeks, and have no requirement to join or anything like that. Just come out and try it. We'll pay you $800 to play Army for four weeks. Uh, so I was like, sure, I've never been to Fort Knox. You know. <laughs> had maybe hoped to see the gold reserves, which is not possible, by the way, and went there and did exceptionally well. Uh, we had drill sergeants there who actually were drilling at the time, um, connected with a couple of my drill sergeants who really just nailed into me that military lifestyle, which I excelled at. I loved going to the range. I loved land navigation, doing all the night ops. Um, doing the obstacle courses, and I really just loved how it changed me in that four weeks of time from being a, I would say, pretty typical, quiet, reserved Asian female into a leader. Um, so I came back, signed my contract, and then two months later, September 11th happened. Um, and so it was really interesting because my grandfather, while he had served uh, his time in the Army, was actually the most hesitant about me joining because he knew what real war was like. Being a World War II veteran, Korea War, 
Vietnam. Um, he was worried about that for, for one of his only granddaughters. So um, there's a lot of convincing to do, but again, I just did really well in ROTC and uh, loved the experience and the leadership. And as soon as I got my commission, he was actually the one who did my oath of office into the Army. So it was a great bonding experience between he and I, and then uh, I decided to branch military intelligence. Uh, my boyfriend at the time was also in ROTC, and so I decided the best way to support him as an infantryman and potential ranger was to become military intelligence so I could support him and his troops. Uh, so went military intelligence and uh, was really fortunate actually to become one of the very first platoon leaders and executive officers for the Army's shadow drone spy planes that we had. Uh, so the shadows were at the time pretty new technology. Um, I was stationed at Fort Stewart, Georgia with the 3rd Infantry Division and was the second female to ever have them in the entire Army. And so we trained for them um, in 2004. I received my brand new equipment, which was really neat. We literally were unwrapping our tools from shrink wrap, which never happens in the Army. And uh, got my soldiers, trained on the equipment in the swamps of Georgia in 2004, and then deployed to Iraq in 2005. So our deployment was really interesting, again, br using brand new technology that had never been used before. Um, we replaced the 1st Cavalry Division out of Texas who was using the drone technology as well. And my troops flew 24 hours, 7 days a week, reconnaissance missions for our troops, made sure that routes were clear if we saw any kind of suspicious activity, insurgents placing roadside bombs, anything like that, we would call it in and our ground guys would go in and take care of them. So it was a really unique experience for me. Uh, my husband, who I married in 2005, actually during the deployment, and that's a whole other coffee and conversation. Um, but he was a West Pointer, had some unique experiences as well in Iraq. He was in charge of force protection for the division and was in charge of Saddam's physical security while we had him during the trial and was also in charge of all the polling sites while the Iraqis were going through their first national elections. Um, so his story is a whole nother thing. But we got married in 2005 while we were deployed to Iraq. You can do that in Colorado. And, uh, and then we came back. Uh, my grandfather actually passed away while we were deployed to Iraq, um, which is why we got married, because I needed to come home and wanted to bring him with me uh, for the funeral. And in 2006, we tried to get a compassionate reassignment to Fort Carson. My grandmother was back here by herself, and the Army wasn't having it at the time. We were doing the increased deployments, 18 months long, um, and since the Army couldn't guarantee that we would both get stationed at Fort Carson, we decided to get out in 2007. We moved back here to Colorado because, quite frankly, my husband's from Ohio, and there's no <laughs> way I was moving to Ohio if Colorado was going to be a choice. So we moved back to Colorado in 2007, and in 2008 is when the Medal of Honor um, con convention was here in Denver and I don't know if any of you remember that or attended it uh, but my husband and I actually volunteered for that convention when it was here got connected to some you know of our country's finest men who have received that award and was really impacted by their experiences especially our Vietnam era veterans and the welcome home that many of them never received and definitely deserved so I decided to start in two nonprofits. I went to Regis University to get my master's in nonprofit management and worked for a nonprofit that helped military veterans transition into civilian life through employment opportunities. So that really became my expertise area. I'm really good at resume writing now and helping with that military to civilian translation. And while I was working at my nonprofit organization, XL Energy, then in 2013, wanted to start their own internal hiring process. And so I was already connected to them as a company that hired many veterans through my nonprofit. So then I launched that program and have always been engaged in the veterans space since then. And I think some of the skills that the Army really helped me um, in my transition and helping others transition is one, like Lacey said, is that networking piece. You know, finding out who you need to know and what they can get you, quite frankly, and knowing how to use that for your benefit and for others. The other thing that the Army helped teach me was your leadership. You know, it's, 
you know, we always say false motivation is better than mo no motivation. And it's totally true in the civilian world as well, especially being a female. You know, being a woman in the military, you have to exude that confidence, even if you didn't. Otherwise, your troops really wouldn't respect you in many ways. And so it's, no, again, knowing, you know, what garners that type of respect, whether it was the rank as an officer. Um, you know, luckily, many, many troops do respect that rank, regardless if you're male or female. And then also being able to physically keep up with your troops or kick their butts in PT <laughs> tests. Um, and so a lot of those things really helped to just uh, make sure that I was doing what I needed to do transition as well as help others. Um, I think the biggest thing in that transition was knowing who your allies are, knowing that you should get connected to veterans because I think the average, the average life cycle of a veteran is kind of you get out and you leave the military knowing all well that you're leaving this lifestyle behind and really want to trans transition. But then realizing later on, I think it's three or four years later, that you need that military connection. Because like, again, like Lacey said, you don't relate to other people anymore um, who have never been through those experiences. Um, and I think that's why it's fortunate that I've found in a, in a partner and my husband, you know, somebody who lived those experiences with me. Um, because we get each other, we don't cry about little things that, you know, are out of our control. And it's um, just knowing how to, how to really harness those efforts, so. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jennifer, and I grew up in Alamosa. I don't know if you guys know where that is, down south. Sand dunes. Down by the sand dunes, yes. Uh, small town. Uh, my family has a long history of the military. Um, my grandfathers were both in World War II. One of them fought in the Battle of the Bulge, the other one in the Pacific field, in the Pacific arena. And then my brother and my father and my uncle are all Marines. I am the first female in my family to join the military. And I decided I wanted to go to the Navy because I like Marines, I just don't want to be one. <laughs> <coughs> um, yes. Um, so I grew up on, on stories of aircraft carriers and the med, and that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately for me, that's not how it worked out. Um, I was kind of a cerebral child and never had any intention of joining the military. I went to college after high school, and I did. I always loved languages. Um, so I studied Spanish, and through there I ended up studying a little bit of Italian and French and Portuguese. Um, one of my professors in college got me into Arabic. And after I graduated with my degree in Spanish, I was like, well, what do I want to do now? <laughs> I wasn't ready. I, I thought I wanted to go to medical school, and I wasn't ready to do that. And so I'm whining to my brother about it, who happens to be stationed in Okinawa at the time. And he listens to all of my whines and says, Jennifer, why don't you just join the military? And for the first time in 22 years, it sounded like a good idea. Uh, this was August of 2001. And uh, so I decided right then I'm going to join the Navy. And of course, a couple weeks later, we had September 11th. And my mother is like, are you still going to do this? I said, of course, especially now. I really want to go and learn Arabic, and I want to do that for the military. Um, it took a while. I, initially, I talked to the officers, and they were kind of jerks. So instead, I went to the enlisted recruiters. Right, yes. Um, they, they, they were kind of jerks. So. Uh, so I went and uh, was kind of between wanting to do corpsman because I was interested in medicine or doing a linguist because I love language. The wait for both was over a year. So I was in delayed enlistment waiting to go to boot camp for a year. And um, finally went. And that is the only time I've ever been on a Navy base was boot camp. Everything else after that was joint service. Uh, I went to the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. Uh, where they taught me Arabic, and that was a year and a half of Monday through Friday, 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon of Arabic. It was a lot. Um, the, the group that I had there, my class, was, was quite unique. We had officers and enlisted. We had a couple foreigners. Uh, we all, at, at DLI, you can have all of the federal civilians go there, and then all of our allies who need to learn languages also go there. So we had all of these people on base. It was fascinating. And all of our teachers were native speakers from, from Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. Um, so we got a really good education and really learned a lot about each other. Like in my class, we had a ranger, we had an interrogator, we had a colonel, like we had all kinds of interesting experiences there. 
Um, so after that, I was stationed in Fort Gordon. All of the Middle Eastern languages in the military usually end up at Fort Gordon at some point. That's in Georgia, in Augusta, Georgia. And we had a big command there, and again, it was a joint command, so we had everybody. Um, I was working with everybody, which I really enjoyed. I really thought that was, um, it really made me appreciate the Navy, that's for sure. Um, we got rope yarns. You guys know what a rope yarn is? Our commander on a Friday afternoon, it was a slow day, he'd let us go at noon. And we were the only branch that ever got that. <laughs> um, but we worked hard. And, you know, because uh, we were linguists, we were listening to things from the Middle East. Most of, most of us ended up working a lot of mid shifts um, because the middle of the night for us is the middle of the day for them. And at the time, my brother was stationed in Syria and also in Iraq for a while. But while he was in Syria, I was working a Syrian mission. So I got to feel like I was looking out for him. Um, I got to feel like I was listening to the air around him and keeping him safe, which was really important to me. And so I did that for quite a while, and I can't really talk about a whole lot of it. Um, but it was really fascinating work, and everybody in there was doing different missions in support of everybody on the other side of the planet in real time. We got to see it with the cameras from the drones, you know. And uh, so we did a lot of that. And then... What did I want to say after that? <laughs> um, our biggest, I don't know, probably my, my most interesting experience that's different from everybody else's is that we all stayed in the same place. Like people would come and go. They would deploy to the Middle East, but they'd always come back to Georgia. And the group of people who worked there worked with each other for their entire careers. So we didn't really have the same sort of constantly changing experience that a lot of military people did. People would go, they would come back. And um, so we're a very tight-knit group. And I also have realized that I don't bond well with people who don't understand that, especially since so much, so much of it I can't even talk about with the general population. Um, so we're still very, very close. I still see them a couple times a year, even though we live all over the country now. And um, getting out was, was difficult for me. Initially, I went straight into medical school, which might have been a bad idea, um, six, six, six weeks after leaving the Navy. I really struggled. I uh, really struggled with transitioning from a really organized lifestyle where I knew exactly what was expected of me, which I really thrived in. I'm sure you guys understand that. And uh, going to a place where suddenly nobody understood me and nobody cared. So. I did struggle quite a bit. Um, I ended up leaving medical school after a while and then deciding to go to Scotland instead. So I went to Scotland and I studied there, but it always comes back to the language for me. And still I'm kind of a cerebral person, so I do a lot of tutoring now. I do like math and science and language tutoring, which I really enjoy. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to get more involved in the veterans organizations now because Really, veterans are the only people that really seem to get me anymore. And uh, I really want to support them with my voice. And here I am. I guess that's about it. <laughs> I don't really know. I've got to check my posture. Uh, you're right in the middle. <laughs> that button on the side. Questions? Um, two or three times during your, your talk, you made reference to Got My Soldiers and uh, could you speak what you can speak about these little critters you're, that you're talking about? You mean the, the actual people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Whatever you were soldiers or people. referring to is Got My Soldiers. Oh, gotcha. No, so in 2004 is when I actually received my unit and my assignment to the, the drone unit. And in June of that summer, I, re I literally received my soldiers. I received 22 soldiers who were a mix of maintenance crews and then the actual operators who flew the drones. And then later that month, we actually received 
our UAV drones, um, which were the shadows at the time. We were using those for reconnaissance operations. So we received in the unit 20 of those, and then again, 22 soldiers within my platoon, and then a, about 80 total across the company. And, and then during that time, we trained on them in the swamps of Georgia to deploy to the deserts of Iraq. <laughs> but didn't you stay here all the time, or did your company? No, so the shadows actually, we went over to Iraq. We were stationed in Taji, which is just north of Baghdad. It's a, about a 15 minute Black Hawk ride <laughs> between, between downtown Baghdad and Taji. And then we had our launch and recovery site because the shadows are the ones that have this big metal launcher um, that shoots the drones up into the air. The drones were, have like a 20 foot wingspan and then the payload is a camera. Uh, we would flow, fly those between 4,000, 7,000 feet up in the air 24 hours a day around the entire division area of operations which encompassed Baghdad and the surrounding north and south areas. And then we had our operators actually strategically placed at different uh, fobs or bases around Baghdad. Um, so then when we lost line of sight from the launch and recovery site, the operators would take it over from Baghdad and then fly them over specific areas that we were assigned to at the time. And then the operators would hand them back off to our launch recovery site. We'd, we'd grab those drones from the air and then land them back in Taji again. Uh, Taji was actually an Air Force field, um, an air base that we used, and so a lot of helicopters and um, Air Force components at that site too. So you were mainly uh, servicing the machine and others were utilizing them for the mission out. Yes, so for example, if we knew that there was a unit that would be doing a convoy or special operations in a specific area in our area of operations, we would fly for example, a reconnaissance route over that route for the 48 to some two hours prior to that mission driving on the road to see if there is any suspicious activity, people placing roadside bombs, um, weird groups of people gathering in one place and that kind of thing. And then we could call in and to make sure those troops were driving on those roads or doing even regular foot patrols um, could be safer. I actually just ran into a guy recently who is a Marine Corps veteran and he said that he, he thinks it might have been my soldiers because we were over in Iraq at the same time who actually saved he and his Marine Corps infantrymen who were on the ground. They were doing um, some foot patrols in an area of Baghdad and our guys saw again a large number of civilians on foot headed towards them coming from the north. We called it in let them know, hey, we see about 100 to 150 people coming your way from the north. Um, we don't have anything scheduled, like there's no wedding ceremonies or anything like that going on, so just keep an eye out. And sure enough, it was, it was about to be an ambush, so they were able to reinforce their defenses on the north, um, and everybody got out okay. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting stories like that that my, my soldiers directly had impacts on. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you might be asking you a question. Yes, sir. I just want to know your perspective. You've been on the war for over 15 years. We've committed millions of dollars. Thousands of men are gone. <clears throat> What's your view of how to end this problem? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one to me. Uh, I'm going to need a minute on that one. No, both of you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't I have a fix all either, but I have some thoughts. Since, since my focus was Arabic language and culture, I have some strong feelings about the Arabs and mostly that they're amazing people and incredibly hospitable. And um, the bad ones are so few and far between. Um, but I think what we need to understand as Americans, as opposed to what they're going on through there, is that it's we're destroying their homes, we're destroying their cities and their hospitals. Like, we're not entirely responsible for it, but because we're there and this is happening, it continues to happen. And if we need to get out of there, we need to stop doing that to them. So it's, it's really hard to pull yourself out of a war 
when you're so deeply entrenched. And uh, the only way to stop all of the craziness that's going on over there is to leave. And it's going to be messy, but we can't keep interfering in their daily lives the way we have been. So I don't know if there's a fix all other than to just leave. It'll be messy, but I think that's the only way. I don't know if you guys have to solve that. Yeah, I would agree definitely to a point. I think though that what we're currently seeing with ISIS taking over and g regaining some of that control that the US had gained control of, some of those key cities um, like Mosul for example, um, we have to leave with a plan though and make sure that the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police that we are leaving behind to include those civilians are trained in a way that they can defend themselves and take care of it for themselves. I don't think the U.S. should go into any country and say, hey, we're going to invade or whatever it is because of X, Y, and Z reasons and then we're going to leave with no plan for you to carry on so that you can maintain your own country's stability. I don't think it's our responsibility to keep that stability for them, but I think we should leave them with the, with the tools and with the skills to be able to do that for themselves. And I don't think we did a good job of doing that in Iraq, obviously. I think I would agree along the lines with Keeney. We're definitely nowhere near being able to pull out completely there. Um, I just got back in December of 2014 from Afghanistan. The amount of troops that have left in that time frame has already created a lot of problems. We are leaving them our equipment. They don't know how to use it. Um, they have our radios. They don't know how to fix them. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a big beast of a thing. And if you think about just pulling all our troops out, it's going to end up like a power vacuum, these people are going to kind of lose control again and we will have wasted all the years that we have been out there if we just decide to pull everybody out now. We have been lessening troops in 2014. There was a huge drawdown as we were there and again we need to be able to give them the training and the things that they need in order to be successful once we pull out and it's, it's I can't think of an answer. I, I don't know what it, the overall fixer would be, but definitely would not agree with 100% pull out at this point. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and it's not going to be quick and easy, unfortunately. All three of you have the same foundation uh, and it speaks to the root cause analysis as to why they have to be stable, why they have, uh, what are the issues, what is causing the turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> lack, of, lack of infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> lack of infrastructure. Um, we have not blown up the hospitals, but there are no hospitals. So that sort of thing, the lack of infrastructure, that and I know my brother did a lot of work with the marine transition teams in Iraq, trying to get these guys ready for us to leave. And those guys struggled a lot with being considered traitors by their own people. So we try to get them ready to go, but they're the bad guys to everybody else around them. It's a, diff it's a difficult, you know, how do we fix that? There's not a way to fix that. We can try to prepare them as much as we can, but there's not, the, the people there don't trust the police because there's a long history of bad police in the whole of the region. You know, the backsheesh, the, we call it Bribe. bribes, yes, and corruption. It's really bad, and their infrastructure, medically, legally, and every way. I mean, their streets are blown up. They can't even get an ambulance to some places. Maybe if we could help them fix their infrastructure, you know, and like bring in the CBs and pave the roads and build the hospitals, and that might be the easiest way to get out of there. It is. <coughs> You say it's a lot of money, but we're wasting billions of dollars every year to stay in mm -hmm. I agree. We can't afford to keep this up. I no. agree. We can't afford to pay for the war. We can't afford for the lives lost. No. And the men injured. I work for the VA. The mm -hmm. number of men that are injured that are filling up the hospital. Some of the problems you have with the VA is that it was never designed to handle the number of men that it has right now. We cannot continue this madness. No. We have to do something else. 
whether it's pull out or not. I, you know, I was part of the pull out in Vietnam. Well, so what? We left. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the thing we have to do here. Let them rebuild their own country. Mm -hmm. We'll help them. But let them build their, rebuild their own country. But we cannot continue to do what we're doing now. No. This is insanity. I think another major problem for them is they don't have really strong leaders to help them. Do you think, do you think that the, the troops have the support that they really, really need to go in and kick yeah. butt and, and get it done with, uh, with uh, more troops, more weapons? Mm -mm. Is that <coughs> I'd say it's, it's a toss-up. So I mean, I think that Again, from my most recent experience, it's when we were there, there are a lot of rules of engagement and strict things that they put on us. So, you know, a lot of special operations troops couldn't go out, or if they did, they had a number of people requirement. They had all these requirements, and it makes it very hard for them to do their job to the best of their ability. And with that being said, at the same time, they're doing that to try to reduce casualties to to try to make it safer, if you will, for U.S. troops. At the same time, it does hinder them from kind of having a wide range of doing whatever they need to do to get the job done. So it's, it's kind of like a catch-22, and it's hard. And, and I think now that there are less troops there, we are, we are seeing a little bit better of full reign of support saying, hey, do what you have to do. This is the end state. This is what we're looking to do. Um, it's, it's train advised it's CIS, it's not conventional army, we're not going in there, you're not in charge of the patrols anymore, you're starting to hand it off, you need to train it. But at the same time, I want to make sure that you have the support and the rules of engagement that you need to get the job done. So it's, it's a fine balance and from 2014 at the very end to where it is now, I think that they're giving them a little more free reign of what they need to do in order to be able to pull back um, their involvement there. Oh, there's. I, uh, could I ask a question about how we civilian women can better support the increasing number of women in the military? Mm. Let me think. What do I want? What do I want? <laughs> um, I would say things that you're doing, you know, with the American Legion Auxiliary is welcoming these women who, you know, may be direct members themselves, maybe spouses. Uh, you know, as, as women in the military, I think it's hard for us even to relate to spouses of former military because, again, it's while you know the experience, it's still different actually living it. Um, I actually, again, I married a West Pointer, so I, I was the spouse and I was also the service member. Um, so it's it's just hard to really get those connections and find out who you can connect with um, and those things that you have in common that'll really bring them out. You know, I think they always talk about, especially with mental health right now across the board, is just talking about those experiences and getting them out so that it's not just confined to the veteran space and it's not just a veteran experience, but that is a people experience. Um, because the more we talk about it, the more others start to understand it and the more it becomes normalized. You know, PTSD is not just a veteran experience. It is a human experience. TBIs are not just a veteran experience. They are a human experience. But because of the wars that we've been in currently, we have that increased number of TBIs and PTSD diagnosis. Yes, military sexual trauma. That's becoming, that's getting more attention nationally. Um, and so it's talking about them so other people, other women, other men will come forward to talk about their experiences and what they need because we don't know what they need, right? Um, I, I have been fortunate and have not been diagnosed with PTSD, although I will say probably I'm more short-tempered and I don't, in the corporate world, I don't put up with a lot of BS when my coworkers are like, oh, you know, I can't get this job done. Yes, you can and you will. <laughs> you how to do it. <laughs> yes. And by the way, you don't have to worry about it and freak out and cry because literally no one will die if this doesn't happen. And so it's it's just getting it out there and normalizing it for everybody, whether it's men, women, children of the deployed, just talking about it so that everyone starts to understand it better. Are you aware of 
aware of any statistics right now about more or less women joining the military, say, from 10 years ago to, to now? Uh, as far as I know, I think it has been relatively the same between that 14 to 16 percent, at least serving at, on active duty of women, um, and that the same numbers have come out of veterans as well. When you're looking at women, Lacey, what about in the guard? Any what about in the guard? Any any change in the ratio of women in the guard? No, it's pretty. I would say maybe a fluctuation of like a three percent change up or down either way, but I'd say it's pretty even keel. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I actually changed jobs while I was in Afghanistan. I'm trying to hold this so it doesn't rattle. Sorry. We can, here we go. Um, it changed from when I first got there to the end. So. My unit is a very small 30-man unit, but it is a very senior unit. It's what we call a TSOD, a Theater Special Operations Detachment. So we fall under U.S. Army SOCOMS, um, U.S. Army Special Operations Command, uh, USASOC. And while there's only 30 of us, we're kind of like augmentees, if you will. So we go and we support special operations. And in our unit, it's about a third Green Berets, and then the rest are enablers like myself. And when I first went out there on our camp, it's like a 200 meter by 200 meter camp, um, I did basically surrounding strategic intelligence. And so that means I kind of worked, I did all the reports, figured out what was going around the area, what our major threats were, kind of did analyzations on, you know, what the elections were, who we thought was going to win, what would happen if somebody won, um, things like that. And so it wasn't like my first deployments where you're looking at routes and, you know, when the IEDs are going to hit, when we're going to get indirect fire. It was more just strategic intelligence, knowing about the different insurgencies and how it would affect the, the elections and things like that in 2014. Then a part of it was mentoring. So we had the Afghan National Army Special Operations Command, ANASOC. Um, so it was a special operations advisory group and most of the ODAs and the Green Braves would go down the hill and they would train, advise, assist these other folks in the Army, in the Afghan special operations to help them succeed in their missions. And there was one female, she was a female lieutenant colonel, she was a, an Afghan, um, the only female down there. And my job was to go and mentor her since she was doing intel, so I did part of that. So then my job changed to a little bit of mentoring on her half. And probably for about two or three months, that's what I did. Then they tried to make me do, um, it's basically, we call it, it's kind of like informational interviews for the Afghan armies to make sure that they weren't a danger to our U.S. soldiers when they go, what we call green on blues. Um, people where the Afghans or greens would shoot U.S. soldiers to, that were training them. So we would run them through a series of questions. It wasn't like an interrogation or anything. It was a series of questions to see if they would potentially um, turn their backs and, and turn on Americans. We'd also review their backgrounds and do some other stuff on them. So I did some of the screenings for that. And then I got pulled off of that, and at the very end, I actually was incredibly fortunate enough to work with uh, ODAs, which are operational detachments. So 12-man teams, the very, very end, um, most of my unit went home, and of the two ODAs that were doing the train advised assist missions, they lost what they call their 18 Foxes, their intel person. Two of them were coming in late, so they were out an intel person, as well as the intelligence contractor that we usually get out there. So I filled the gap for that for two months. Probably the hardest, most stressful, best experience I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, don't know that I'll ever get to do something like that again. And just that dynamic, 100% different than conventional army and something I've done before and absolutely loved it. And uh, again, that was where Keeney was mentioning, you take your job so seriously. You're planning their operations when they would go out. You want to make sure you get all their intel. And the stress comes in, these are your buddies. These are the people you know. If you don't tell them something that you read in a report or you miss it and somebody dies and you're watching it on a screen, you feel like that's on you. So now you go to the corporate world and you're like, literally, nobody's going to die. Why are you freaking out right now? Like, this is so simple. Um, but, yeah, that was the end of my trip. And it's, it was probably, like I said, the most stressed I'd been, best friends I ever met. I will say if you've never met a Green Beret or worked with them, they're probably the most chauvinistic bunch of other <laughs> words I have at the end of that that I can't probably say, um, but ended up being my best friends for life. So that was my life.
last trip in 2014. Uh, kind of a general question for all of you. I will nobody yeah. take it. I think obviously we're in a room of, of people who probably are similarly like-minded, but you know, leadership starts at the top and it really needs to come from them as well as we need to see those actions come from our leadership in reinforcing um, the behaviors that are expected of our troops. You know, I think regardless of what branch we are, we you know, will always joke with each other and pander each other, but it doesn't matter if you're a Marine enlisted infantryman or if you are an Air Force officer, you should be held to the same exact standards of professionalism within the military because we are held to a higher standard, you know, and it's disgusting and it, it doesn't do the military any good at all when things like this come to light, especially in the civilian world because of course, you know, one half of one percent of this entire country has volunteered to serve their country and the rest of them are getting their news from CNN, Fox, whatever it is that will always paint the military in that type of light. And so we need to do what we can both as b veterans and as active duty soldiers to make sure that if we are hearing of these things to take it to the top because that's the only way that it can get fixed. Um, you know, especially, you know, with some of these really high profile cases that have been coming to light, somebody knew and they just didn't say anything. Um, and it needs to be addressed immediately and whether it's addressed internally first and handled internally first, that's always a preferred way. Um, but the leadership really needs to take care of that and then internally, you know, at the lowest levels of the military, those soldiers need to be accountable for themselves and for, for their peers. Mm -hmm. Any comments? <laughs> we saw quite a bit of that sort of thing. Um, it happens a lot in the military. And I think the biggest struggle I saw for the women I knew who went through this was that they didn't want to inconvenience operations because sometimes the person who has perpetrated this could be important to a mission and the leadership doesn't like to take those important people out of the mission and because it's inconvenient it doesn't get dealt with so I don't, you know there's not how do you fix that yeah. I would uh, agree a hundred percent with um, a lot of the things they're saying but I will take one opposite sort of stance um, it's probably three to five of us women out of two, almost 300 men on our tiny camp. And I think a lot of it, as Keeney mentioned, is leadership. And it's not fair, I will state first, um, the things that we have to put up with as women in the military. But you do what you have to do to get your job done. And with that being said, I've seen where now that I'm becoming a senior, N or I am a senior NCO now and I'm becoming that older person, unfortunately, in the military, no longer private, um, is to mentor the younger. So when Keeney mentioned leadership, that's key, but I mean, I'm not talking your company commander, your battalion commander. You need to look at the immediate person above you. I've had to tell women, it's probably not best that you wear those tight clothes. It's probably best that you wear incredibly loose baggy clothing while you're here. Is it fair that you have to dress like this and you have to conduct yourself a certain way so that people purposely don't come up and say something to you? Not necessarily, but you know what? It's something that you need to deal with and recognize as a woman in the military and you are holding yourself to a higher standard and making sure that you can conduct your day-to-day -day operations and I'm going to train you on how to deal with these things. And I, I honestly, I mean, even in day-to-day -day civilian world, again, these things happen, right? They always say, oh, well, she was wearing this. That's, it's not the woman's fault and it's not okay that the men can do that, but at the same time, it's one of the things that women have to experience in the military. And I think that if you can start getting that mentor, that leader that tells you, 
you know, come to me if somebody's bothering you, I will make sure it gets taken care of. I will take this very seriously, but let me also give you tips and tricks, and while it might not be fair, this is what you need to do to conduct yourself appropriately to make sure we can get a job done. I have a couple questions. Uh, first for uh, Lacey and Keith, yeah. and then Jennifer, a follow-up question. But um, let's take this to the corporate world. Um, the three of us, Lacey, Keith, and myself, work for Excel Energy, and we have a very active veterans group. Okay, so what companies can do to help veterans who are coming into the workforce? One, it's more than just towing the corporate line and talking the talk about being military friendly, right? It's actually about in placing the programs that need to be in place so that veteran employees can be successful in the company, and it's not just about hitting recruiting numbers for one. Um, you know, you hear all these numbers from different corporations, you know, Starbucks just recently, we're going to hire 10,000 veterans, which they met their goal, and now we're going to hire 25,000 veterans. Um, you know, same with XL Energy, we're going to hire 10% military veterans every year. Um, but it's more than recruiting. It's what have you done to ensure that managers within the company who could potentially be supervising these veterans, how are they trained? How, what do they know about working with veterans, especially the newly transitioning veterans who have you know, come from high school to a war zone to the corporate boardroom? Um, do they understand those specific needs and those intricacies of what a veteran employee needs for that structure and guidance um, to be successful in the company. And then two, like, can, does the company have a group of veterans for that mentorship and for that leadership? Um, you know, again, I can speak specifically to XL Energy, um, but we have this great veterans group that is very connected. We do volunteer events together and try to communicate to non-veteran employees about the veteran experience, whether it's Vietnam or, or more, you know, we, we do have a lot of Vietnam era veterans as well at the company and, and within the workforce. But it's those veterans who um, help other veterans transition into the corporate workforce or into civilian life in general. Um, you know, when I was really doing veteran employment, there were statistics showing, you know, in World War II, um, veterans came back from war, our, our guys came back from war to a very supportive and patriotic country. They got their jobs. They were very successful in building some of what makes this country great from, you know, being CEOs of companies to, you know, the whole industrial revolution and, and everything that we've gone through. Then we had Vietnam, and the Vietnam era veterans obviously came back to nothing. Um, so those veterans struggled the most, and so now there's this huge gap between when the World War II veterans took over as managers, supervisors, CEOs, you know, to this gap of employment where we don't have that many Vietnam era veterans who served as CEOs and have built their own businesses and became supervisors to hire on these new veterans. So there's, there's, there's this gap right now that we're seeing because veterans will hire veterans. Um, because again, we understand each other, we understand the background that we come with and it may not be something that's on a resume, but we know that, you know, Lacey and I, we know that when we see a military resume come across our desk, they come with these soft skills that their civilian counterparts are not going to come with. That's not visible on a resume. So how do we communicate that to these hiring managers who, again, most of them have never served in the military or have any direct connection to the military any longer? So I think once we get these now post-9-11 veterans who are growing, they're using the post 9-11 GI bills to further their education, they're coming into these companies now at entry level and are gaining those skills and increasing in their rank within those companies to become managers so that they can hire veterans and become those mentors for this even newer class of veterans who's coming in, right? And, and you really got to hand it to these kids. I serve on a few of the service academy selection boards within our great state and these kids, despite knowing 
we've been at war for the last 15 years, they still want to do it and they're so passionate about serving their country. And my thought anytime I'm, hire, I'm interviewing them to join a service academy is, how will we support you when you get out of the military? And I think, you know, our generation, those of you who are still in the workforce can really do that by providing that insight and, and providing that mentorship within your companies, within the community. And again, just talking about it. Um, getting out there and, and having those veteran voices within the company to tout about veterans and the skills that they can bring and how much more impactful a veteran population can be on a civilian workforce. Because um, we've been there and we have a lot more experiences and, and are very entrepreneurial in our mindset in making sure that these companies um, are at the forefront of their industries. I, I think Keeney covered most of it. I will just add one extra thing on the end and um, that's a face to face with the veteran. So company wide she covered what you could do as a company but um, I get to work directly with veterans and say let's look at your resume and they'll say I'm a cook your utility industry, you don't have anything for me. It's like, well, do you order things? Are you in charge of people? Do you deal with sanitation? Do you budget your money so you can actually feed these people? Let me help you. And I think that's the most rewarding for me, not so much the numbers, but seeing somebody grow and, and showing them, no, you think you did nothing. Let me explain to you what you've done so you can see your true potential. Um, I think that's the best fun, rewarding thing to do in that aspect. Yeah, and I think just real quickly, too, before we hand it off, um, is just really making sure that these new veterans who are coming into the workforce know that they're more than just what their MOS was, mm -hmm. right? You're more than your MOS. You bring a plethora of skills that every company is looking for. And then internally, those veteran employees, how can we make sure that that company leadership understands what that veteran job seeker looks like and can bring to the table. And it's not just a job description and it's not just can you check all these boxes, but it's what can you do to help our company um, be better. So, that's it. All right. Well, in the Navy, we're not more than our MOS. We are our MOS. <laughs> Which is the rating system. Um, There's a long tradition in the Navy of the rating system. My rank was Petty Officer First Class, but virtually no one ever called me Petty Officer. I was CTI, which is Cryptologic Technician Interpretive. And every job in the Navy has its own rating. We each have our own little badge that goes on our uniform. And we're all very proud of those things. So the decision to do away with the ratings was that last summer sometime was extremely unpopular because that's our tradition and that's how we that's what we call each other like we don't we call each other these terms and so to take that away from us i think it only lasted about two weeks before the uproar was loud enough to to change it back because that's it's very important that's our identity i mean we identify as sailors we identify as americans but we also very much identify with our mos um, especially because we did really, I mean, we weren't infantry. We were very specialized in what we did. And even in the CT world, there was, I was an I, which was for interpretive, but there was also people who worked on the computers and people who did all of the Morse translations. And all of them had different ratings as well. So it was extremely unpopular. We're all very glad to have it back. Um, and all of us were pretty much swearing that we were going to be CTIs for life, regardless <laughs> of what the Navy said. Um, but I'm glad they I'm glad they didn't do away with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, a question or a comment for Jennifer and then a question. You mentioned uh, the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to enlist in the Marine Corps when I got out of high school and they wouldn't take me because my parents were married. What? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> my my question is you mentioned the term rope yarn. Yes. That's only the second time in my life I've ever heard that. Do you know where that was derived from? Oh, I remember once upon a time looking it up. Um, it's, it's obviously a naval phrase for the lines that we had on the ship, and I think it was like cutting it off, um, cutting it off early, <laughs> basically. I don't know. Does anybody else remember? Rope yarn is actually comes back from the British Navy. Okay. And on, usually it was a Sunday. They would have a, a, what they call a rope yarn. It's where the sailors would go on deck and sew their uniforms. Yeah. They would make their uniforms back then. Uh, they would uh, rope yarn. They would take the ropes and splice them for the sailing vessels, for all the rigging. And it was a it was a day of leisure. We didn't have to do normal work. Mm -hmm. We just did 
the work of kind of housekeeping? For us, it was a command picnic. <laughs> Mando fun. Mando fun. Army calls it yeah. hot smoke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we got those and nobody else did, so that was pretty nice. Other questions? questions? Anything we didn't cover? <laughs> How do you handle the uh, comments from anti-war people uh, who just scary? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think. That's what I do. Like a son-in-law who uh, would have uh, fled to Canada to avoid the draft. That doesn't mix well with me. Um, that kind of in, in work, I thought, we, I ran projects, so we had, we had a war room for our project. And the young lady said, I don't like calling it a war room. I said, well, it's a room where people are going to sleep. And the young lady says, I don't like calling it a war room. And she didn't have any idea of what was involved. Uh, and, uh, so how do you handle that kind of stuff? I tell them you don't have to support the war, but you damn well better support your troops. So, yeah. I mean, it's you, you can not like war, but there are people that are out there fighting that are your U.S. citizens that are supporting your freedoms. So whether or not you support that war, you think about supporting your troops and what they're doing for you to be able to sit and stand where you're standing and do what you want to do. Um, you may not want to serve, but there are people that are out there fighting for people's rights. And whether you agree with it or not, those are U.S. soldiers, U.S. service members, sailors, airmen, what have you. Um, I don't always agree with what the military does or the presidencies or politically, but again, that's it's the stance is I wear this uniform. And again, my, my opinion might be a little different because I'm still in. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a difference of opinion. My friends, my boyfriends, my... You know, everybody that I know are still out there fighting. They're still overseas right now, and I think my perspective is a little different. So I've got one foot in still, um, but you know, again, I, I try to take a, a non-political route and just say, well, you can have your opinions on wars, wherever we're at, what we're doing, but think about the person that's serving and mm -hmm. support them. Mm -hmm. uh, if a young girl in high school approached you and asked you. You know, I'm trying to figure out what to do in my life here, and I could maybe join the military. What would you tell her? And what would be some of the pros and cons? I get that question almost every week, because I'm a tutor, and I work with high school kids, and a lot of them are girls, and a lot of them ask me. Um, and I like to tell them that they should do it if they want to. Um, it's going to be difficult in ways they never imagined, and... I think probably the hardest thing for me, you know, they say boot camp is hard, but for me it wasn't hard physically, it was hard mentally and like reframing my brain to think that way and realizing what was important and what was not important. Um, but I, I, you know, I like to give them, I like to give them the truth. I say, you know, you will probably come across people who will try to assault you. You will probably come across people who will look down on you because you're a woman. I mean, obviously, it's going to depend a lot on the job that you're doing. I didn't face that so much. I mean, I think my percentage-wise was like almost 40% female. But that, that's Intel. So I think that's pretty common in Intel. So we had a different experience. But I know some of my friends who went into infantry had a very different experience than me. But I want them to know the truth. I want them to know that these are the issues they're going to face. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't do it. So I'm a mother of two young girls. I have a four-year-old and an 18-month-old. And my husband and I have set up a 529 account for their education, but we clearly plan on them going to one of those service academies. <laughs> yeah. um, but I always want to encourage girls to go into those male dominant areas, regardless if it's the military or, you know, you hear this huge STEM push right now. Yeah. Because it only takes one person to break down that first brick before the whole wall will come down. You know, I'm, I'm a target demographic for Facebook. I'm 37 years old. I'm a mom. I love sharing baby pictures. And on Facebook, there's actually a picture of a woman, one of the very first women to run the Boston Marathon. And 
something like running a marathon as a first woman, this photo shows other men trying to stop her. The race director was trying to stop her from running a marathon, the Boston Marathon. And now look at us today. You know, I mean, it's absurd to think that women couldn't at one point run in the Boston Marathon. And so it should be absurd, you know, to this point of thinking women couldn't be astronauts, women couldn't serve in the military, women couldn't serve on the front lines with our infantry. You know, and, and again, it just takes that one person to, to pull down that first brick before the whole wall comes down. Um, I always encourage these young girls who are, you know, interviewing to become in, um, enrolled in one of the service academies to encourage them, you know, reach out to me when you get there. Let me know if you need a mentor, um, you know, anything like that. Because I think it's important that we are there and that we're present and that we have these, these young girls and other mentors like ourselves and, and mentors like yourselves to support them. And we need our men, too. We need our men to encourage these girls um, to pursue their dreams and let them know that just because they were born a certain way doesn't mean that they can't do anything they want. Um, you know, it's some of the strongest male role models that I've had growing up in my life who encouraged me to do this. Again, my drill sergeant, I'm still, I, I called him dad throughout my entire life. I still call him dad, um, and he's still in. And, you know, again, he was one of those who, who kicked me in the Kevlar and said, cadet, you can do this. Don't be scared. You know, you just need to man up and do it. And, and that's what I did is I manned up and became a woman. So... <laughs> I'm with Keeney. I 100% encourage it, and I will say a very short story for you. I almost didn't re-enlist last year. I had 12 years. My contract was up. I was fed up because, unfortunately, I, from my last deployment with those three to five women and almost 300 men, saw a lot of women that were not conducting themselves appropriately, and they get that bad rap, and it, it was really tough for me, and I kind of wanted to give up, and you know, I've had people say, oh, I don't want to, you know, it makes me mad when I sit next to my husband and they say thank you for his service and I'm the person that's the veteran. And I said, well, I love when people don't think that I'm a veteran. I look them square in the eye and I'm like, actually, I'm the one that served for 13 years, not him. <laughs> um, but I appreciate that because then I, you know, I have that dual lifestyle. But on my last deployment, I had two people, both Green Berets, and again, most chauvinistic bunch of swear words at the end of that that I won't go into, but um, they never worked with women before. One of them was a first sergeant. He just retired last year. First Sergeant Willis, never forget him. He came up and he told me, yeah, it's my first deployment overseas and I've never worked with this, you. And I'm staring at him like, Ex excuse me, first sergeant? He's like, I've never had to work with, uh, with women before. Oh yeah, you got a daughter, you got a wife. You ever talk to them? A mother, maybe? Yeah, it's like the same thing. You've interacted with them. And he's like, I've never had to deal with them. You know, if I'm like Green Beret, I do this, that. About the third day in Afghanistan, we're hiking up in Kit on the mountain. And he comes up and he goes, you know what, Galanka? I just want to tell you, you're the best female I've ever worked with. I was like, well, first time, I'm the only female you've ever worked with. But thanks, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and he was like, honestly, though. And then another guy, he's actually a third group uh, ODA guy, and I was doing intel. And he's the one that pulled me over to work for ODAs at the end, but he never worked with women. He's like, well, I hate women in the military. They just sleep with my guys. I'm like, oh, and your guys aren't to blame, right? They're, they're angels. But, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, I don't like women in the military. and they, they don't do anything and blah, blah, blah. Well, I started doing intel briefs. He started getting intel from me, and he was like, well, yeah, wow, you know your job. I said, yeah, I do my job, and I do it damn well. And I take the time, and I'll help you. Would you like me to read some reports? Here's some reports for you. You might need this information. Um, at the end of that, he said, you know, I've changed my perspective on women in the military. I, I've changed my perspective. And so I highly encourage women, go be that person that changes these people that have been set in their ways for 20 years as a Green Beret. 20 years. Retired, retiring as a first sergeant that says, I, I don't do women, especially not in special operations. I don't deal with you and change their perception and have them say, you're the best female I've worked with, even if you're the only female they've worked with. But <laughs> changing that perspective, and it only takes one, as Keeney said, to kind of start laying that foundation and change a perspective. It is a changing world. It's a changing war. Um, and I think that that was what I would encourage somebody to do. It's going to be hard, and it's going to be tough. But if you come out on top, you will make such a big impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
She's like five foot one, too. I bet she's terrifying. The Air Force Academy just announced their first female Commandant of Cadets um, and the first openly gay female. Yeah. So again, it just takes one person to do that. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, the first female Commandant of Cadets for West Point. I mean, she was in her, in their howitzer, which is the yearbook, she's listed as most likely to become the soup. And that was back when they had just let females in, let alone, you know, thinking that she could be leadership back at her alma mater. So I think it's pretty incredible um, how far we've come. We've obviously got a really long way to go um, before we change the mindset and be, it just becomes normal and we don't have to have conversations like this. Of course, the Navy's a little slow. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of female commanders. Nobody in the top. No. No. <laughs> well, uh -oh. oh. oh. <laughs> Start talking, Jennifer. Talk oh, over him. Like Talk over him. This is. I don't really have anything to add to that. I, I wish they would get on that sooner rather than later. But you know, in talking to these girls, these young girls who are asking me these things, I think the thing that I want them to understand is that it, the military helped me be fearless. You know, I, I moved to Scotland by myself with my dog and like just arranged everything on my own. And people all around me are telling me, God, you're so brave. And I'm like, I don't feel brave. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just doing what I need to do. But like the fact that I have that mindset that I can go out there on my own and accomplish anything that I want to, like I'm glad that I have that mindset and that's what I want these girls to have, you know? Like they can do their own thing and be their own person, but they're gonna have this inner strength and this inner confidence to just go do their own thing. Like, not about being a woman, just about being a strong human being. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other questions? Come on. I know, that's my favorite part, so I don't like talking. Yeah. <laughs> I like to ask you a question. Let me try. I don't know if I can use this up. There has been in the past, and I don't know if it's still true, but the physical requirement for women are less than women. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Does that not are the phys are the physical requirements for women different than those for men? Yes, they are. Does that, does that compromise our team as a whole? And why would it not? We're physically different. Like males just have way more upper body strength, and no matter what women try to do, we'll never match that. We have our own strengths, and I think we make up for our physical upper body weakness with other strengths for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have incredible endurance. We can go along with these guys for as long as we need to. So I don't think we ever, I've never seen a woman hold somebody back. No, less than one in 10. Look at all the expertise in the other areas that we need to provide, not just the And I, I would, yeah, no, so I would agree though. You know, you're talking about the physical requirements and and being out on the front lines, for example. So I think all of us are probably in agreement as women in the military that we don't want the standards lowered, but just know that physically we are different. You know, it's not that um, being in the infantry, I mean, I've carried, you know, a 30 to 50 pound ruck on my back for 12 miles on my own. Like, we can do it. We don't, we're not asking. I don't think it's us asking that the standards are lower. I think it's a political move that these politicians who have not served their countries, who have not never carry that ruck. carried a rock, <laughs> think that women need that. And none of us who have served need it or want it. We want to be on par to prove our own worth. And again, we all know, especially being a, being a young, small female officer in the Army, I knew that to be able to get respect from my soldiers, I needed to physically keep up with them, if not kick their butts. Yeah. And I kicked their butts every single time, <laughs> regardless of the standards. And it's just not meeting the minimum requirements. I maxed out my PT test every single time. I qualified expert in shooting my M16 A1 or my A4 
every single time because those are the two things that we rely on in the military. One, if it, needs, if it comes down to it, do you have my back and will you kill somebody for me? Yes. Two, will you physically be able to carry me out of a war zone if I needed it? Those are the two things that we require. And all of us, it's funny that we're all intel officers, right? Because... Whoa, whoa. Don't say officers. Off, sorry. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. I work for my paycheck. <laughs> I work hard for my paycheck, girl. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all of us were intelligence because we wanted to support our troops, our, our, our people in the best way that we could. With our, and with our own strengths. And so I think it's different. And there are some amazing women who have been very successful in, you know, graduating from ranger school and those kind of things. And they didn't have to be, they didn't have to give up being women, but it was just showing their mental strength and their physical strength well, also caveat, at the same time. Those classes, they do not lower, they don't get the women's standard. It's a one right, standard across right, right. the board. Yeah. If you're looking at a normal PT test, then you have different standards, right? For me to max out my PT test is going to be a different score than a male maxing out their PT test. If I were to go to ranger school, it doesn't matter. There's a, You have to meet the standard. And yes, some males might exceed it, but you have to meet that standard and they don't lower it for those schools. Right. Um, for certain schools, you, you don't get a lower standard. Um, well, I shouldn't say lower standard, but a different uh, grading type of thing. And the standards uh, are there for a reason. They're to weed out the weak regardless of your gender, right? If a, if a small male couldn't keep up, he's not going to make it, and we wouldn't expect that the standards be changed for him as well just because he wants it. Mm -hmm. so, does that answer your question? If I could just add something to that. Um, I had a job where we had to carry a lot of gear, and one of the first things that a couple of guys said to me was, well, I'm not going to be carrying any gear, and I just looked at it, oh, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it just made me more intense that mm -hmm. you will never carry a match stick for me because I can carry my own gear and I don't want your help. And I think once you prove yourself, that's how you and I believe being respected in yeah. military. Once you prove yourself that you are a leader, that you can take care of yourself. But I do believe there are women out there that um, flirtatiously or whatever want to die. I'll give you a, a quick example too of um, one of my first experiences when I was in ROTC is um, I was at um, and I don't know what it's called now but we called it advanced camp so it's at, between your junior and senior year of college and you go to Fort Lewis then to do more training during the summer and I was in charge of a mission because you always went to the field I was in charge of a mission that the LTAC gave me and it was um, like a 10 mile course that we had to navigate. I mean, you, we were out for a whole week doing just different squad tactics and FM7-8 infantry tactics um, to learn that. And mine was a 10 mile course where the objective was on top of a hill, was on the other side of a hill. And the easy route, what, right, was to just do a road march. You had to tactically road march, everyone separated and, um, in their different formations alongside of the road, but I knew it would take a long time. So I was like, you know what, guys, we're gonna we're gonna stop here. I'm gonna reevaluate situ the situation because we've got 30 minutes before we're supposed to get to this objective, and we're not gonna make it if we go at this slow, typical route. I was like, you know what, we're gonna take that hill, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> we're we're cadets. We're gonna be officers. I don't want to take the hill. And so what I did is I strategically aligned, again, in like two minutes, I strategically aligned my unit. Uh, we had 12 people within our squad at that time. And I put my big guy up front, because I was like, you know what, you're going to have to break brush. Like, you're just going to create a tunnel through the forest of Fort Lewis, Washington. You're going to break brush for us. I'm going to take the radio, because I need to communicate to our tail guy, who's our, our second biggest guy, that, hey, you got to keep pushing everybody else forward. And we literally formed a train, and I was running back and forth between the front and the back with the radio on my back and my rucksack, um, making sure all of, my, all of my guys were on the same path, no one was getting lost, and we all just had that motivation to make it to the objective. And at the end of that, um, the lieutenant who was in charge of that, who was kind of our, um, like our overseeing officer, he was like, that was really impressive. Like I've never seen one physically 
anybody decide to take this hill. And two, for you to run back and forth to make sure that your soldiers were taken care of, that was pretty incredible. And so again, it was taking those skills that I knew I had. I knew I could motivate. I knew I could physically keep up. And we made it. And it was you know, those kinds of things that really solidified it for me. And one, I can physically do this. I knew I could mentally do it. Um, I had been through a lot just as a kid, so mentally it wasn't an issue. But it was physically, can I do this? And knowing that, for sure, helped. especially our, our panelists, um, Lacey, Keeney, and, and Jennifer. But before we break up, I want to present to all three of them one of our Museum Challenge coins for, for their excellent discussion. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. And, um, and again, thank you for coming. members of the museum, Uwe Grappenberg, who many of you know, served the Third Army during World War II in Europe, uh, is in the hospital. Uh, and we have a get well card back in the library. So if you would, please, as